Hello and welcome to a special 4th of July weekend Dividend Cafe podcast. This is David Bonson, the Chief Investment Officer, Managing Partner here at the Bonson Group. And uh, those of you watching on video, you can tell that I am actually sitting in a different spot than normal. I'm at a hotel in Sag Harbor, New York, where I'm away with my family for the weekend. We get all settled in our new home in East Hampton here in a few days and uh, I'm more or less working out of my Manhattan office starting next week uh, for the next five weeks or so. Um, and, and it's interesting being in New York, uh, being back in the city for uh, most of this week, um, I definitely got a chance to see something that I think kind of parallels or has some sort of metaphorical connectivity to what is happening in the economy at large and what we saw in the jobs report uh, today. And that is a city that is opening, but not fully reopened. In other words, it is progressing. You see different things moving, but nowhere near, have we arrived nowhere near to the final destination. And so this, the, the Thursday jobs report that showed 4.8 million jobs are covered. Um, when analysts were expecting 3.2 million, uh, it outperformed by 50%. Okay, that's a massive uh, miss for economists, analysts to have once again underestimated the robustness of the, of the jobs recovery. But I don't say that critically because I do think it's very difficult to get a feel for what to expect out there. The trajectory of improvement is very impressive, but there, there is still a substantial amount, many millions of unemployed people, and there's a lot of room to go. We have an 11.1% unemployment rate. So it's half of where it was at the, that low point of when they had shut down the entire country. But it's still two and a half times higher than it was pre-COVID. And obviously we're not getting back to that level for quite some time. I think we're going to get to a lower point than people expected at a quicker point than people expected. But the key issue right now is how many of the temporary job uh, losses will prove to be temporary will come back. That number continues to hold up. It's two months in a row where those classifying as temporary have been right. That it was 78% uh, or maybe it was 79 uh, in May from the April report that were classifying their joblessness as temporary. Now that number is at 58 or 59 because that 20% were, really were rehired. There's very little evidence of substantial people that were temporarily laid off, now classifying as permanently. There's some, there's more than we want. That 500,000 number bothers me. But the fact, and again, seeing another 1.4 million people file initial jobless claims this week, um, I, I have to think there's a really substantial uh, lag factor and, and processing issue going on with some of the states that are doing that reporting. Um, but over because the the... Unemployment rate dropping 11.1 and the amount of 4.8 million people who, who were unemployed that say they got jobs, that, that doesn't line up mathematically with some of those other numbers. And so at the end of the day, this theme of improving, doing better than expected, but still having a long way to go, much like the restaurant situation in New York uh, that I experienced this week. I think that's kind of the theme of the American economy right now, will be for some time. If one wants a, a positive, besides the market going up 800 points this week, um, out of the, the stock market action, I would not just point to it going up 800 points, largely making back the 700 or so it had lost the week before. I would point to it doing so in the face of an avalanche of negative COVID headlines from the media. Uh, highlighting this big increase in new COVID cases, which is very legitimate. There's no question that we have had a uh, tripling of testing and uh, in the country over the last month, and we've had about a doubling of positive cases. Um, that positivity rate is significantly lower than it had been a month and a month and a half and two months ago. It's ticked up a little higher from its low point of two weeks ago. Not probably surprising as we've had more and more reopening and as we had those protests and a lot of mass congregate activities. Um, but the really encouraging thing for anyone who's trying to be objective and pay attention 
is that with a big increase in COVID cases that's now been going on for several weeks, we have not had an increase in mortalities. We've had really consistent decrease in the fatal uh, infection rate, the percentages um, leading into that uh, ghastly outcome. I think economically, the market is looking at the COVID cases and saying the same thing that I believe the whole economy is going to have to say, and I think policymakers are going to have to say, and I think the whole society either has said or is going to end up having to say, which is that COVID is going to be with us and we're going to have to live with it and have a normal and functional economy with certain safety measures and, and whatnot at play um, until there's enough immunity into the society, either from a vaccine or from the organic endeavors that we go through. Um, I think we're headed to that place. Uh, I won't use up all of our Divin Cafe time to talk about all the, the COVID aspect, but I mention that to simply say that um, the market's resilience is one thing, 800 points is one thing, doing it with that case escalation in Florida and Texas and, and the way the media sort of covered it with governors shutting down bars and new restrictions here, new restrictions there. Um, I, I really do believe that that says something. It can reverse at any time. What I pray it won't do is reverse because we see a spike in fatalities. Um, I do not believe we're going to. I think that it is a healthier part of the population that's testing positive. I think a lot of people testing positive have very light symptoms, if any. Um, that is in data after data piece that I'm reading, studying individual states, significant amount of medical testimony to the fact that we're just simply not in the same um, arena that we were with the coronavirus in March and early April, mid-April, et cetera. Um, look, the... The, the first quarter of 2020 was the ninth worst quarter market history. The bulk of the quarters that were worse, I think it's something like six or seven of the other eight in front of it, were from the uh, Great Depression era. And now the second quarter that ended this week was the ninth best quarter in market history. So you had um, a just massive drop, drop down. You had a massive recovery. There's still a lot of work to do. Uh, the bond markets have mostly fully recovered. Um, the the uh, damage done to equities is not fully recovered, but it was substantially so. Small caps had a huge comeback. Emerging markets have done quite well. Europe still has room to go. NASDAQ's you know, more or less fully recovered, particularly with some of the larger names in that index. Um, so I made the comment yesterday in COVID and markets that the only investor uh, you know, activity that is kind of irreparable that's happened this year is those who experienced the ninth worst quarter in market history, but those who didn't experience the ninth best quarter in market history. And the reason I say that is that's an awfully tough thing to come back from, to now kind of re-enter having missed that degree of snapback. It is a testimony of the foolishness of market timing. It is a testimony to the ability of markets to confound people because a lot of people still believe this doesn't make sense um, or they uh, explain it away because the Fed's been very supportive. But see, the Fed being supportive is a reason to have been in it, not, not a reason to have been out of it. Um, whether or not the economy is going to recover in the way people believe, the optimists believe it is, is somewhat moot to exactly what the market does. Uh, the market is is very much volatile. Um, you were up 800 points this week, and you're down 800 points the week before. You know, no one can run a victory lap right now, and and certainly the bears that want to see an extension of market distress um, probably can't be feeling too good about the way the last three months has gone. My view is neither bullish or bearish in the immediate short term. My view is that there's going to be volatility, but my view that I think I could have never forgiven myself for if I had uh, uh, sacrificed our own principles here, is that in every high distress period, a substantial amount of the recovery that inevitably comes, comes quickly and makes it impossible to try to time one's way in and out of. And I think that the, the extraordinary events of the last four months have reinforced so much of that. 
Um, as we go through the rest of the year, our projections really kind of simple. It is that the much like I talked about with this jobs number and with New York, uh, the overall energy level of their economic reopening, we are facing a uh, situation where the data points are all going to be getting better. And the debate is simply at the trajectory at which they'll get better. And so that leaves us very vulnerable to volatility because some data points are going to outperform expectations as these last couple of jobs reports have. Some data points are going to underwhelm and you're going to see markets move up and down around some of it. The bigger question will probably end up becoming at some point in time, I don't think in Q2 earnings results, but certainly into Q3, I think it's going to come down to whether or not corporate profits are holding up as resiliently as the market might hope it is, they will. That's, it's too early for us to formulate an opinion on that. The best opinion I have for the remainder of the uh, second half of 2020 is you have an awful lot of support from the Fed, uh, some amount of fiscal stimulus that's proving very effective, some amount of fiscal stimulus, probably more coming, that's proving to be very deficit-y, but not necessarily very effective. And then you have an economy that's going to have a lot of zigs and zags and unknowns. And so my advice for investors is to have an asset allocation appropriate to their level of risk reward trade off and uh, to allow the dividends to accumulate. This is beating our drum of the importance of dividend growth, which we think has proven to be a masterful way to manage risk in this environment and to maintain income for cash flow investors and to accumulate uh, greater amounts of shares, particularly at distressed prices for accumulators. On a risk-reward basis, we think that makes a lot of sense, but we expect there to be volatility in all aspects of equities. And so, uh, look, the DividendCafe.com this week goes into so many different subjects. There's so many charts. I can't cover it all here in the podcast, but I encourage you to read this Dividend Cafe. It's one of my favorite ones in terms of the amount of information we're giving you as a projection of the second half of the year. But in the meantime... Um, Please reach out with questions you have. Enjoy your weekend, wherever you may be and whatever the state of economic reopening is in your community. Have a very happy 4th of July. And please know that we here at the Bonson Group celebrate this great country with you. And we look forward to further dialogue about the state of the economy in the second half of this year. And any questions you have about your own portfolio and financial planning. Thank you so much for listening to the Dividend Cafe. Happy 4th of July.